Greetings, this lecture is on diversity management. Um, we'll move right into the first slide off of the title. Um, what is diversity and diversity management? And what you can see there is diversity it can be broken down into four basic categories. Um, Society for Human Resource Management defines diversity as encompassing an infinite range of unique characteristics and experiences, and this is true. So many times when we're thinking about, you know, oh, we need a more diverse organization, we're thinking about the dimensions that are more demographic oriented, you know, based on legal issues or, um, you know, um, visible characteristics, things like that, ethnicity, race, sex, gender, etc. Really, um, when we're talking about diversity, there's all sorts of things that make us diverse, um, not least of which is our personality, the way we make decisions, things like that. That's really deep diversity because it really gets at the essence of who we are as people and what we value. Um, other things are, you know, stuff like internal dimensions, things like age and ethnicity, and it's those internal dimensions that are much more about the demographics. Um, a lot of, they are genetically based, um, you know, we certainly can't control the race that we're born to, the sex that we're born to, our orientation, um, our basic abilities, the raw abilities. Of course, we can always be taught things and learn how to do things, but our basic capacity to have um, uh, physical or mental or, or um, you know, capabilities and, and abilities are, um, are, are limited by our, our genetics in some ways. Um, so those, those internal dimensions, which tends to be the most popular way that we think about what is diversity. Lastly, then, we have the um, uh, external dimensions and organizational dimensions. The external dimensions are things like um, I'm married, I have um, children, I have served in the military, I grew up in New York, I grew up in California, I like the snow, I've been, I live on the beach, I live on an island. I mean, all these things really influence the way that we see the world and the way that we experience other people and things like that. So external dimensions go a little bit deeper um, and they really are a reflection of the things that we've done in our life and how those things have shaped us and formed the way that we view the world. Lastly are things like organizational dimensions, as I said, which is about where you are in the organization. Now, technically speaking, organizational dimensions are kind of attached to those external dimensions uh, because they're about the things that we experience and where we are in society. Um, but I like to keep it categorized separately so that we think about you know, how union is it being unionized or non-unionized or management versus supervisor versus entry-level worker, all of those things within the organizational context influences people's opinions and their diversity and things like that. So, when we, for example, if we talk about having a diverse cross-functional team in our organization, it doesn't mean that we want a team that has, you know, just men and women or you know a couple of different ethnic groups what we're talking about is having union and non-union upper level manager lower level manager and across different departments and disciplines so um, we can use diversity in a very different way when we're thinking about um, how it may impact um, things that we do in the organization okay next slide Diversity management involves a whole lot of different things, not least of which is how do we train people to be prepared for diversity. And one of the things, you know, that I emphasize pretty strongly is that you can't put people into a diverse organization without giving them the tools to know how to manage the conflict and the process losses that go along with having a diverse organization. We tend to find that when organizations are more diverse, it takes longer to make decisions, there's much more conflict. Um, there are some downsides to doing that. The good news is there's lots of positives too. Um, there's positives in that we get a wide variety of ideas. And so part of your diversity training is that we need to teach people to be open to those new ideas um, and particularly in the brainstorming process as they go through and they're thinking about suggesting different ideas and, and moving from there. So um, diversity training is essential. Yes, we do need to train people on, you know, what does it mean to be African American? What does it mean to have privilege, you know, if you're white um, or if you're a male or, you know, 
you know, name whatever category it is. If you come from a rich neighborhood versus a poor neighborhood, there's all sorts of privilege at all sorts of levels. But the nice thing is it doesn't have to end there. That, that's, that's not enough. Um, you do need to go deeper. You need to talk about differences in the way people make decisions and the differences in their personalities and then the differences in how we manage all of those differences by um, open communication, interpersonal skills, and conflict resolution. Uh, these are all an important part of diversity training. Other things that are important to diversity management is if you have to have diversity as part of your business strategy. The nice thing here at SIUE, we've fought hard for years and I'm proud to say that we finally have diversity, a diversity plan here at the university and it's a very explicit part of the university's business strategy which is, um, which is really good. The next item is about affirmative action. Just because we may not be obligated under the law to do for affirmative action doesn't mean it's not a good thing to do. If your goal is to find the best candidate for a job, you want your pool to be as diverse as possible to reach out to all groups. You know, there may be an individual in a group that you don't want to look at, but may be the best person for the job, and you're sort of cutting off your nose to spite your face because you're not willing to expand your pool to include those. It doesn't mean that we don't include majority groups. We do. It's important. You actively reach out to majority groups. You actively and affirmatively reach out to women and minorities as well. So the goal is everybody has equal access. Everybody should have an opportunity to compete. Another issue about diversity management is it helps us with legal compliance, and legal compliance is a big part of that. Um, you know, we talked about disparate treatment and adverse impact and all the laws around managing diverse people. We don't want to treat people differently because they are different. Um, you know, we need to obviously respect differences, um, uh, tolerate differences, but the big issue is, you know, we also need to recognize that we're legally obligated to make sure everybody has an equal opportunity to access things. And so the last thing we want to be engaged in is um, illegal behaviors because that is bad in terms of diversity management, but it's also bad in terms of getting us a lawsuit. We want people to be aware of diversity. Um, and part of that happens with diversity training, but the goal here I think in the big picture is we have to recognize we're all different and we don't have the same life experiences and so my experience as a white female who is 50 years old is going to be very different than an African-American male who's 22 years old or a Latino female who's in her 30s. Every one of us has a very different experience and our experiences are authentic and are they're authentically ours. No one has the right to say that your experience is wrong and only my experience is right. Um, we perceive things based on who we are, but we also have to recognize that someone else's point of view, someone else's perceptions of a situation are not invalid. Um, they're just different. Um, and a lot of people struggle with differences and, and how to sit with differences. Um, and I feel like I have a, a you know, um, pretty fortunate that I, I go to a church where I can sit in a pew with someone who's a theist and someone who is an atheist and someone who is um, a pagan or Wicca and someone who is a Buddhist. And we can all sit in the same pews and work together cooperatively for our joint um, goals and joint values. You know, social justice, love, inspiring others, those kinds of things. And those are important. And so it's a struggle, though, for a lot of people to see that there may be different paths to someone's truth. Um, and I think that's where um, people really uh, have a hard time, even in business organizations, is recognizing that someone else's path um, is just as valid. It just, you know, it's just different from yours. Lastly, we want to be very, very careful of recognizing that my own personal beliefs um, about things, whatever they may be, may not be relevant to the business organization. You know, my issues around abortion rights or my issues around birth control rights or my issues around, um, you know, religious differences regarding homosexuality um, or what is the one true faith tradition, um, whatever that might be. And I may have a very strongly held belief. I mean, if I am part of the Latter-day Saints Church, I don't believe in um, alcohol and caffeine. 
um, and I don't drink tea and coffee because of that, but that doesn't mean that I should tell the rest of my organization, you're not allowed to drink because I don't, or you're not allowed to, um, uh, you know, uh, drink coffee because I don't. Um, you know, if you're Jewish, you don't eat shellfish. Do you tell people, sorry, no, you're not allowed to have, you know, shellfish around me because it offends me. It's no, it's personal beliefs are personal beliefs. They reflect on you. The organization is separate from that. Um, now the struggle, of course, we have right now is from a legal perspective, where that fits into things like the Hobby Lobby case. Um, and there is obviously some concerns about where that boundary begins and ends around the personal beliefs of the owner versus the personal beliefs and values of the corporation, where do they begin and end and where just because the CEO doesn't like a particular value about birth control doesn't mean a, a he or she could impose their values on the rest of their employees. <clears throat> Certainly that would be my opinion. A lot of people feel differently about that and I respect that. So uh, right now the courts, you know, have leaned towards, you know, if the CEO's values are in a certain way that then that obligates the organization to follow those uh, values, but it'll be very interesting to see how that may um, happen on appeal and how things may change over time. It'll be very interesting. Our next slide, um, which will be slide number four, um, it gets into some of the issues around diversity training. Um, and as you, as I said, um, there are some mixed results for diversity training. Some types of trainings do really well. Some of them fall flat on their face because if all you're going to do is talk about legal awareness and cultural differences, you know, that's not going to be enough. We have to teach people how to be more sensitive. We have to teach people how to be um, more careful inter, um, uh, interpersonally and to deal with uh, conflict resolution, as we've talked about. There's a lot of backlash around this because, again, people don't like differences. And so when we're talking about different groups, people feel like they're just beating a dead horse and who cares about differences and, you know, why should I, um, why should I deal with these um, other groups because they're not like me. So those are some of the issues and challenges around diversity training. Our next slide deals with the arguments for diversity, and then the one after that is dealing with the arguments against diversity. And let's start with the arguments for diversity. Obviously, as we talked about in the lectures on the environment, the U.S. is much more diverse, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And organizations need to reflect their local labor market and should reflect the diversity of the people um, that are in the country. Um, why should an organization only have you know, majority group people and not have, you know, create job opportunities for everybody. The next item is that managing diversity will lead to lower turnover, as we've talked about, um, among minority groups, but certainly overall higher commitment um, from not only the minorities, but majority group individuals and fewer lawsuits across the board. So again, we're doing this because it does lead to better outcomes in many ways for the organization. We have decreased hiring costs because people are more likely to stay. There's greater levels of commitment to an organization. Um, you know, when an organization treats you well and you're in a minority group, um, you become very loyal to them because you recognize that they are valuing you for who you are and not for the label that's attached to your forehead or to your back. Um, and so these things are, are nice. Um, and the fewer lawsuits, well, that goes with being more conscientious about diversity and legal issues. Um, you do have less lawsuits because you're more um, respectful of that. Diversity widens the talent pool. Again, we've talked about this numerous times. You have a greater pool. It's what affirmative action does. It improves the pool of people that you can pull from for um, hiring and for promotional reasons. And then you increase the likelihood that you're going to hire the best person for the job, however that may be. Um, the next item is that diversity may drive business growth um, by helping us to connect with um, diverse customers, um, having greater creativity and problem solving, which we know um, obviously from a lot of groups research is true. And it does create greater flexibility because, you know, even if one person in the group may not like a particular idea or understand it, there may be others that enable us to, to adapt and to be flexible and to um, um, move about and change as the environment changes. So this is a, an important thing for us. The arguments against, you know, sort of, you know, parallel some of those arguments for. And some people say, well, you know, a diverse workforce doesn't improve productivity. It may not. 
Because if you don't manage those process losses, if you don't manage the conflict, if you don't teach people how to work together you know, interpersonally, yeah, you're going to end up with a problem. It's huge. Alternatively, um, you know, if you ignore it, yeah, that's going to be a problem. So our goal is let's focus on the important things in training, not just sensitivity and awareness, but also how to deal with the crunch points, how to deal with those tough moments when we have a conflict, when we have differences of values and differences of opinion. Um, number and the second item, the results of diversity efforts are not easy to measure. That's absolutely true. Um, there are many a times when we're trying to see the relationship between a diverse workforce and an outcome that may not necessarily be one that we can connect. A lot of organizations will say, yeah, I have you know, better relationships and greater commitment and we find that the morale is better. But can you directly prove that? That's more challenging. Um, so a lot of times organizations are looking for really clear metrics on these sorts of things and it is a little bit harder to do that. Um, I think if nothing else, we have to think about it from a legal and an ethical perspective and how important those issues are from a legal and ethical perspective, which I can truly appreciate. Um, and if you're thinking about it from an, eagle, from an ethical or legal perspective, then, you know, sometimes the, um, the, out, the effort outcomes that you're looking to measure may not be as important because it's, it may be the intention that you have that you bring to the table that's much more important. Uh, the third item, diverse employees don't always embrace diversity initiatives, and that's, that's true. And we've already talked about how, if, um, you know, people like Clarence Thomas and Ben Carson, who are um, uh, big-name conservative African Americans in the country, don't like diversity initiatives. They feel like they want to be able to compete on their own merits. Um, and I can appreciate that. Um, who wants to feel like they're getting a hand up um, to, in order to be able to compete? But here's the thing. People like Clarence Thomas and Ben Carson may have come from a better socioeconomic class where the assumption that you were going to go to college and you were going to go to law school or medical school, you were going to be successful, became a very consistent message for them. And so they had the tenacity and the resilience to be able to compete because they were taught that from day one growing up. But not everybody gets the same message. Not every woman gets the same message. Not every person in every ethnic group gets the same message. Um, and so because of that, we if you assume that everybody interprets the messages the same way, that would be ideal, but they don't. Some people don't get the message that they have value and that they can compete because they're not taught that by their parents or by the social group that they are living within. And so our goal is to not just a lot, you know, not just help those who, you know, are more than capable of doing it on their own. But our goal is also to create an opportunity even for those who may not have believed that they could compete. And so when we reach out and say, we value you, please come and apply, you're sending a very different message out to people who may not feel like they can compete otherwise. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a good thing, um, ethically speaking, legally speaking, um, and I think for business reasons, that's also a good thing. But that's, you know, my personal bias on that. Next, diversity training may not add value to an organization. Again, goes back to our discussions around, you know, some of the challenges if we don't do a good job of diversity training. But the other issue, too, is, again, if we are treating white males as if they are the reason why, you know, all things bad are happening in society, that's a poor way of getting them to embrace this idea of diversity, and it's certainly a poor way for them to feel like diversity matters. Um, you know, you have to make a better case for it, and certainly... Um, recognize that when you treat them like they are the, the cause of all the problems, they're not going to embrace diversity at all. Of course, I wouldn't um, if, the, if the situation were in, you know, in my shoes. Diverse markets may not care who is selling to them. Um, and, and sometimes that's true. I would not say that's true in all cases. Um, and, I, and a great example of this is Longo Motors out in California. They have a very diverse customer base because they have a very diverse workforce. One of the reasons um, that it works that way is because Longo Motors sells cars, new and used, and they service a very diverse ethnic community. And one of the things that they did is they started to have employees in their organization that could speak a wide variety of languages, languages that, you know, on average you wouldn't see. For example, you know, um, you know, basic Spanish or basic, you know, uh, Afrikaans or something like that that you might see in other parts of the country. In 
LA, it is hugely diverse, particularly with a lot of Asian cultures. And so when you've got um, a diverse um, workforce that can speak a whole variety of different languages, it attracts the customers who can speak these languages. So when you go in to negotiate in, in, for a car, it's a very vulnerable, you put you in a very vulnerable situation. Why would you want to, you know, how uncomfortable would you feel if you're trying to negotiate for a car in a language that's not your primary language, you could be easily taken advantage of. But when you can negotiate in your primary language, it makes it so much easier um, to, um, to, to buy the car to get a good deal and customers feel really happy about those opportunities. Um, and so they become very loyal to companies like that because they feel like um, this company cares about me as a customer. So while I might argue in some circumstances, I mean, I don't care who sells me soap. You know, if you know the scientific reasons why this soap is better for my skin than another kind of soap, I don't care if you're male or female, if you're purple or green. You're selling me a product that makes sense to me. Um, but when it comes down to maybe ethnic sensitivity or issues around women's issues like, you know, vulnerability for, um, you know, sexual assault and things like that, then wow, you know, I'm more loyal to a company that really respects and understands, you know, these diversity issues and are willing to work hard, you know, for them. For example, Starbucks. You know, Starbucks has been a big, huge proponent of LGBT marriage rights in the state of Washington, which is where their headquarters is. And, um, because they respect that diversity and they're very active in that area, it creates um, a greater loyalty among the LGBT community for people to want to buy from them. Lastly, the white male bashing, as we've talked about multiple times, it's not inclusive, it's divisive, and it's discriminatory. So we, that's one of the bigger problems with diversity management. Okay, so the next slide, which is slide seven, deals with diversity awareness continuum. You can't assume that everybody is on the same page with respect to their comfort with diversity. And in fact, we have a, there's a wide spectrum of differences in the way people feel comfortable with diversity. I'd love to believe that most people are at least in the minimizing differences category, right? Where we sort of say, hey, you know, you're the same as me. We have the same blood, blah, 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 blah. But it's more complex than that. Um, Let's start with the bottom, which is the most unaware, least diverse perspective. Um, this tends to be the denial group. These are groups that believe anyone who is non-white is considered subhuman. Um, as far as they're concerned, if you're not white, it's not relevant. And so you have no purpose, right? Um, this may go back to the days where people believe that you know, people who are African American were animals and they can be owned um, as opposed to being, you know, human beings, you know, that are worthy of the same rights as anybody else. And this goes back to slavery times and things like that, that they were, you know, you can certainly read all sorts of historical documents around that. You know, white supremacists, the most egregious white supremacists certainly believe that if you're non-white, you're subhuman. If you're non if you're non-male, you're subhuman. And so, you know, women are to be owned um, and managed and, 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 you know, anybody who is in an ethic group um, is an animal. They don't think about them in any other way. It's, 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 it's a mindset. I think it's really mind boggling for a lot of folks, but there are groups out there, minorities, yes, minority group, but they're out there. Um, and certainly we've seen a rise in people being more vocal about white supremacist ideals since we've had an African-American president. Um, the, they've tracked this and we know that there's, um, they may not have increased in numbers, but they've increased in visibility because of that. So um, is it likely that you'll encounter somebody like this in the workplace? It's possible. Not highly likely in some parts of the country and more likely in others. For example, in the South, you may see it more likely, or like in Idaho or Montana, um, you may see it more likely, because that's where, for whatever reason, you know, white supremacists tend to congregate. Um, you're less likely to see it um, in, say, Chicago. It's not to say it wouldn't be there, but you're less likely to see it in cities that are much more diverse. Um, so, um, 
you know, but you may not even know if someone is a white supremacist in your organization next to you because they recognize that their views are controversial and so they keep silent about it. Um, and they don't always talk about it, but what they do in their private life, like the, the KKK, right? You know, you know, by day they're upstanding citizens and by night they wear the white robes. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's a very different um, uh, way of being. So you may not know that someone is, um, but you can recognize that if they are they don't want to talk about diversity or they just, you know, are pretty mum about the, the idea, it's quite likely they may be in, dancing around in that area of denial that anybody who's different from them is not valid as a human being. Again, they're rare, but they do, they do exist. The next group is the defensive group. Um, and this group tends to be much more ethnocentric. Um, they are fearful of differences. And because they're fearful of those differences, they engage in the negative stereotyping because it makes them feel better about themselves. Um, you know, and this is the Archie Bunker of the world. I mean, if any of you, you know, grew up, you know, having your parents tell you about a TV show called All in the Family. And if you haven't um, heard of it, you should Google it, um, look it up on um, uh, YouTube. There are video clips about, you know, Archie Bunker and his, you know, uh, you know, uh, discriminatory words, um, you know, calling his Polish son-in-law meathead and um, calling people who are Hispanic spicks. Um, and, you know, he gets to this really uncomfortable place because the world is changing around him. It used to be all white Catholic, you know, um, Protestant, you know, members and suddenly it's, you know, there's more diversity and there's more racial differences. I mean, and he has a neighbor who's an African American who suddenly makes it big and he moves up to the Upper West Side, Upper East Side of Manhattan and he, he doesn't understand, you know, why this person's doing so well because they're black. And so he teases them and he makes fun of them. And um, and that's the Jeffersons, if you are, were, again, you know, have any trivia about TV shows. Um, so he his TV show was really controversial at the time and it really spawned all these um, different perspectives on, you know, what it meant to live, you know, as the majority group in an ever-changing world um, that's changing both with respect to women and the role of women as well as the role of um, different ethnic groups in society. So people who are defensive just engage in those horrible stereotypes. Um, and there's no such thing as a good stereotype. I mean, there may be groups that say you're the good minorities because, you know, everybody thinks Asians are, you know, are supposed to be successful and really good at math. And yet there's horrible um, repercussions from that kind of pressure as well. Um, so there are all sorts of negative and positive um, negative issues. Even if you feel like you're complimenting somebody, it sets them up for failure because if they don't meet that positive standard, you know, that's going to hurt as well too. So defensive people much more likely to stereotype because of their fears. The next level of development is you finally get to a point where you kind of go, hey, you know, we're not so different after all. You know, you're my neighbor, you're my friend, um, your blood is the same color as mine, and, you know, why should I treat you any differently than I would treat anybody else? And there, there's some value to um, this minimizing difference perspective because it, at a minimum, at least you're recognizing that people are human and we don't need to engage in stereotypes to, um, to denigrate them. Um, but part of the problem is that you are trivializing the differences that people have. Um, that, you know, my experience as a white female growing up in, in a white suburban um, uh, society is very different from a, an African-American woman who grew up in an inner city under Jim Crow. In my, my sort of um, baptism by fire moment was having a conversation with my, um, with my ex-mother-in-law who died recently a number of years ago about some experiences that she had and she was talking about needing to travel between New York City and Washington DC with her white husband and uh, how she knew that she would have to eat at, before she left Philadelphia because they were driving to Washington DC and they would have to eat before they left Philadelphia and kept on going south because you know she, you know for a number of reasons and I and I couldn't understand why they would need to eat you know, in Philadelphia, otherwise they wouldn't be able to eat until I got to DC. I didn't understand that at all. And it wasn't until she said to me, don't you recognize that Jim Crow is an issue? And I had no idea because it wasn't my experience. 
Did it mean that her experience wasn't valid? No, my experience was valid for what I lived and grew up with, but it didn't mean that her experience wasn't valid. And I realized that she couldn't eat in the same restaurant with her white husband because she would have to sit in a different place than him. So if they wanted to eat together on the trip, they had to eat in Philadelphia or wait until they got to um, Washington, D.C. a few hours later. Um, and that was a real eye-opening moment for me because I suddenly realized that my experience was not everybody else's experience, that my experience was very narrow. Um, I grew up, you know, in a white suburban middle-class town and it wasn't everybody else's experience. And that helped me um, to kind of open up my eyes and see the world in a very different way. We move on to the next slide, which is slide eight. Um, we go to the next three levels of diversity awareness. Um, acceptance. This is basically what I came to. After getting this um, eye-opening moment from my, from my mother-in-law, um, I suddenly realized that differences are really okay and not to be feared and that they're, that differences are valid and they're important. Um, if we were all alike, God, how boring would life would be, right? So you start to learn to realize that differences are okay, that there's validity in all different points of view, which is really important. If we can get to this place in society, hallelujah, this would be ideal. Most people, as I say, I think sit fit in either the defensive, minimizing difference and acceptance groups. I think the majority of people sit there. What I would love to see is obviously more and more people moving into what we call the adaptation or integration groups. The adaptation groups are really comfortable empathizing with other cultures where they can really sort of imagine what it would be like to walk in someone else's shoes in a different way. I can think about what it would be like to be, you know, African American or to be Latino or to be male in society and what the, you know, some of the repercussions of that as well. Um, I can, I can definitely think about, um, my perspective and shift my perspective quite readily. Um, I can think about what it might be like to be like that. Um, and it's and it's and it's hard to do, but you can. But we can work on practicing what it means to walk in someone else's shoes. Integration is the highest level. It's where we don't even think about it. We fluidly move from culture to culture, from ideal to ideal. You know, these are people that can move from country to country. That they are so comfortable with differences, they don't even think about it. It's just a part of. Um, who they are. And so this is the highest level of, of comfort, um, adaptability, both cognitively and behaviorally. People don't, it's, it's seamless for them. And I do know people who can do that, and it's still very challenging to do. Um, and they're rare, but those people um, certainly really um, contribute a lot to society because they're just so comfortable with those differences. They see them as opportunities, not as problems, you know. So this is where our continuum is. And then imagine this, that we're in a situation where we have an organization, where we have some people who are in denial, some people who are integrated, some people who are minimizing difference, some people who are defensive. We're all over the spectrum. And you're trying to do diversity training with these groups. And some groups are, are going, yeah, this is boring because I totally get this. And other groups are so angry because they feel like, why are you shoving this stuff down my throat? I don't care about diverse others. And so you've got all these um, differences. Um, and your one-size-fits-all perspective in terms of how do we think about managing diversity um, is going to fall flat on its face. People are in different places about this, and we've got to respect that. Our next slide, challenges to managing diversity. Um, valuing employee diversity is a big challenge based on that continuum that I just talked about. Um, you've got people who are in denial or defensive, you've got people who are minimizing differences or accepting differences, and you're all you know, cohabitating in your organization and you have to figure out a different way and a different message to get to all of those groups. So that can be a concern. Another issue that we have with managing diversity is how do we deal with individual fairness versus group fairness? What's fair for how you treat me um, based on who I am and my differences, but does that mean that I have to treat everybody the same? You know, is a one-size-fits-all approach going to be the way to go? 
and we've already talked about this with strategic HR, right? The one size fits all may not be a good idea because my organization, the people in it are very unique and different. So we have to find that balancing point between being fair and treating everybody fairly and equally and at the same time respecting differences and there's a you know ethical dilemma attached to that as you know for those of you that are in IS 401 we get this that there's a um, an ethical dilemma in terms of how do we treat you as an individual um, and be fair to you but also be fair to the group next the resistance to change obviously people are resistance to being changed they don't like change so are, they get more defensive about managing diversity because change is scary. Um, you know, when we change, you know, our corporate culture, that becomes an issue too. But if we don't start changing the culture and changing people little by little, um, you know, that resistance is going to continue to overpower our ability to make um, uh, uh, advances in diversity. Our next slide. Um, group cohesiveness and interpersonal conflict. Again, differences create conflict and group, similar groups stick together in cliques, um, which not only creates problems for friction and conflict, but also leads to the second point of segmented communication networks, where women speak to women, men speak to men, African Americans speak to African Americans, and no one talks to each other. Like, I will only tell my small group of people what's going on. I won't tell everybody. I will only tell people who are like me. Um, and we start to create little cliques in organizations, and if you think, you know, cliques went away in high school, you'd be sadly mistaken. They still exist. So we have to be really careful of subcultures that can be very divisive in the company. Um, and we have to really work on managing that interpersonal conflict. So that sort of covered the group cohesiveness one and the segmented communication one. The next one, of course, is this resentment and backlash. And, and I've already covered this a number of times in this lecture alone, dealing with the white male bashing and then feeling forced to do diversity training when it, you know people feel like it's not necessary, um, which is not necessarily the case. But we have to be careful of the resentment and backlash that comes from a really aggressive diversity plan. Lastly, um, last page, um, interpersonal competition, internal competition for opportunities, where when you have, you start to recognize that there's diverse groups and you're trying to meet the needs of these diverse groups, a lot of times these groups will, um, will, um, will engage in cannibalism, where they'll destroy each other because it's, you know, the blacks versus the Latinos versus the lesbian and gay group versus the, you know, the female group and everybody's fighting for limited resources and it starts to create some segmentation and clicks again and a lot of infighting. So we want to avoid this and, and not make it so, um, you know, clear lined com competitive in terms of, you know, many groups competing for few resources. We have to be careful of that. And then lastly, the issue of retention. Um, you want to be able to retain people. So you've got to create opportunities. You've got to manage the glass ceiling that we've, we've talked about where we create opportunities for people to advance and to get ahead in an organization. We've got to make sure people's needs are being met so that our diverse people are staying, not leaving. Um, because if they leave, then that creates more costs for us and more conflict for us in the long run. So that's the lecture material, and um, that'll be it. Thank you.